Hey there, everybody. My name is Kat Bowser. I'm your resident fantasy therapist, and welcome to my channel. Those of you here for the first time, welcome. My name is Kat Bowser. I'm a licensed therapist. I'm also a writer working on my first novel. And on my channel, I like to dig into what I consider to be the very heart of writing, which is in the characters. And the heart of the characters is in their psychology. So that's the angle I like to take with everything I talk about on my channel, because in my opinion, it's going to help create a more well-rounded world. So for today, we are continuing with what I call my trope diagnosis videos, which is where I take a popular trope and I kind of dig into the psychology behind it and whether it's realistic, not realistic, and what are ways that we can use it better in our writing, basically. Um, because with very few exceptions, there are a few, I don't think that there is necessarily a bad trope, just bad ways to use them. So this month, um, I am focusing mainly on my top tropes. These are my absolute favorites and they're ones I love to talk about. So that being said, today we are going to dig into probably, I'd say this one is as of most of the time, probably 90% of the time, this is my number one favorite trope. And that is Mama Bear, Papa Wolf, or Older Sibling Instinct or as I like to call it, protective family. So basically this trope is a scenario where the mother, the father, or the surrogate mother, father, whatever the relationship dynamic is, or older sibling comes to the aid of their younger sibling or their child and it is a intense burst of glory, essentially. So this is someone that's going to come in guns blazing. Don't come near my child. Don't hurt my child. Don't touch my child. And the thing I think I love about this is that there isn't a name for like a whole family together. It's always isolated to the individual um, family members. And that's usually because it's not usually the whole family coming together. It's usually one character coming to another character's aid in a specific circumstance. So Mama Bear is kind of a given. The name comes from the fact that you don't mess with the Mama Bear's cubs. You just don't. It's a bad idea. Um, even, even bears that normally will not um, approach humans will do so if they think their cubs are in danger. So that's where that term comes from. Not my daughter, you bitch! <laughs> Papa Wolf is because Papa Bears are really bad parents. <laughs> Regardless of what cartoons and Disney may have told us otherwise, Papa Bears do not make good parents. Papa Wolves, on the other hand, are about on the same level as a Mama Bear. So that's where that term comes from. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. And then older sibling instinct is just the same thing, only it's just an older sibling. We don't really have a cute name for that one yet. So there you go. Yama? No one hustles, Yama! Whoa, hey. Teach him a lesson. Hey, tell us. <laughs> Let's talk about this. <laughs> Hero, get on! Sadashi! Oh, good timing! <laughs> Oh, mama. You okay? Yeah. Are you hurt? No. 
Then what were you thinking, knucklehead? The thing I love, love about this trip too is that in the inverse, it's almost just as powerful. Um, like this, this clip, real quick, of Awen defending her uncle, who has essentially been her um, father figure since she was about six years old, and the passion of the love is still there. And Feast on his flesh. I will kill you if you touch him. Do not come between the Nazgul and his prey. So, the reason I absolutely adore this trope is because my favorite relationships in stories, media, movies, any kind of media basically, are platonic relationships, family relationships. Those are the ones I like to see the most. And when this trope comes up, there's usually two ways that this trope comes up. It's either expected or it's not expected. And I kind of like them both equally, but for different reasons. So, for example, if someone is going to come in and they weren't expecting their family or their parent to come to their aid, it's a great scene because usually the person that's being saved has almost this, not quite an, an epiphany, but a realization that regardless of how rough their relationship may be at times, they are genuinely loved and cared about. So that's always a great way to have some introspection, especially because usually the person being saved is usually the main character. Um, the main character is very rarely the parent or the older sibling. They're usually the ones being saved. So that kind of gives you a really nice opening for them to kind of look back and maybe see things from a different perspective. Because a lot of times, especially in young adult fiction, if the parents are even around, <laughs> um, there's usually that tense, um, batting heads kind of um, kind of relationship, which makes sense for the age range because that's where um, that's the age range where um, the child is basically trying to figure out who they are, and so they're pulling away from their parent more. But I like it when this comes up and there's kind of this reinforcement that, okay, you're pulling away from me, you're growing up, but I'm still going to come and protect you. I'm still going to help you. Even if you don't necessarily appreciate it, I'm still going to do it. And I like that because that is really the root of unconditional love is that you do it not for any reward. You just do it because you love the person. It doesn't really matter if they return it. That's not important. What's important is for you, you, you love them and you can't stand the thought of something happening to them, so you're going to intervene. That's always great. I also like it when there's almost this kind of cheekiness to the main character, whomever's being attacked, and that they're kind of looking at their attacker like, this is a really bad idea. I don't think you should do this <laughs> because they know that their family is coming and they know that someone is going to show up and it's going they're going to mess up this attacker and it's not going to be pretty. I like that because of the confidence in it. And that is another way of showing a strong bond is just this realization that they, they know that even if they're in this tight spot and they probably made mistakes getting there, their family's still going to come. And there is a lot of weight to that. Just knowing that regardless of what you've done or the things you've said, your family's still coming. They're still going to help you. They're still going to protect you. And that is a symbol of a very strong and healthy relationship. And I really want to see more of those in fiction. Because let's face it, a lot of times family relationships in fiction are in need of some therapy, generally. <laughs> so... I like it when I see this because it's a very strong symbol of, okay, this family has its problems, but they're, they're pretty solid. So I always like, love that. And I 
I like it too when you see it from both parents and not just one. I've gone on before about how I think dads kind of get the bum rap in fiction. I still think that's true. So when I see both father and mother jump into this defense, I think that's great. I think that's something that needs to happen more. Oh, puppies. Oh, puppies, are they all right? No time to explain. I'm afraid there's trouble. Big hullabaloo. <laughs> Now we got a Morris. They've run out of room. Hey, what have we got here? A couple of spotted hyenas? Come on, Morris, old pal. Give them what for. I'm right behind you, lad. Ooh. Oh, oh, you clumsy clod. Hey, young man. Oh, I'll knock the spots off you. Let uh, go. Let go. And then there is the factor of the sibling. <laughs> um, I have an older sister myself, and we don't always get along. In fact, most of the time we do not get along because we have very different opinions on things. But that being said, I'm still going to help her, and she's still going to help me. Um, when we were growing up, we actually, um, and those of you who have siblings can probably attest to this, there's what I call the sibling role which is basically, I'm the only person that is allowed to pick up my sibling. <laughs> I'm the only person allowed to insult them. I'm the only person allowed to bully them. If you move in and start doing it too, I'm going to, be, I'm going to get protective. Because sibling rivalry is an interesting phenomenon because it's usually in relationships, that kind of banter back and forth would damage a relationship. And Sibling relationships, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, they actually did a experiment what's it called, years ago. I think it was in the 80s. Those of you who, are, who know psychology probably know of an experiment called the strange situation. What it was, was they were testing the different bonds that mothers had with their children. And so they would have the mother play with, the ba play with a, a, a baby, usually I think they were under a year old. And then the mom would leave and they would see how the child would react. And then mom would come back and they'd see how the child reacted to the mom returning. And that would tell them if it was a secure bond, if it was insecure, all kinds of things like that. They did a version of this with siblings. And what they did is they did the same experiment, except this time they had an older sibling in the room with the child. And they looked at if the older sibling was able to comfort the child or not. And they found that essentially you form a similar bond with your other family members that you do with your parents. And they actually went and did some research on what are the strongest bonds with siblings. It's actually very interesting. This is definitely westernized because I, I don't think they did. I don't think they branched out and did like... Um, cultures in like the Middle East or the Asia or things like that. I think this was mainly restricted to the United States and like I think the UK. But that being said, what they did find is that when they were ranking how strong the bonds were from sibling to sibling, the strongest one was actually sister-sister. And then the next strongest one was older brother, younger sister. Then it was older sister, younger brother. And then the weakest one was generally brother-brother. And I think that says a lot because if you think about it, the sister-sister one, girls, especially in our society, are generally encouraged to be emotional or it's at least accepted that they be emotional. Not so much with boys, which I'm hoping is changing because that's definitely a problem. But at the time that this experiment was done, that was kind of the norm. And the other thing is that an older brother is kind of has this social almost responsibility to protect his younger sister. Again, this is social norms and they're changing and they're shifting. They're always morphing. But at the time this experiment was done, those were the norms. And so I actually would be interested to see what they are now. But that being said, the older sibling coming to the defense of the younger sibling really plays on that bond. And I think you can say a lot about a character's relationship just by if the sibling comes at all. I mean, if they don't come, then it might be that they have a rocky or 
a not secure relationship, which is always a way to, that's always a fun way to, to kind of explore characters' personalities and whatnot. The other thing I really like about this trope is that parents, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the parents right now. This is obviously can still apply to the sibling, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to focus on the parents. A lot of times when this trope comes up, the parents are very fierce, very dangerous. And I always think that's fascinating, especially if the parent character is generally di displayed to be not violent, not really well-versed in fighting, because then what you get is you essentially get Mei Li fighting. You get parents that are using anything they can, their nails, their teeth, the branch on the ground, anything they can use to keep the danger away from their child. Adrenaline is a wonderful thing. It, it really is. Um, and a lot of times what happens is when we see a loved one in danger, because of that bond that we have, it's our body almost interprets it as this is as much a danger to me as if it were happening to me because of that emotional connection, that emotional bond. So seeing a mother or a father seeing their child in danger is just like they are in danger. So the adrenaline kicks in and when adrenaline kicks in, there's a reason that people can suddenly lift cars off their children. Um, Adrenaline is meant to be a very short burst of strength, of speed, because essentially it turns all your non-essentials off. Um, it expands the blood vessels so more blood um, and nutrients can get to the muscles. Um, and it also, it, for as far as I know, it numbs the body, like your pain. Um, when we get hurt and our our pain receptors go off and send messages to the brain to tell us, stop this, this hurts. When your adrenaline's going, pain is considered to be a secondary feature. It's not as important in the moment. So that's why you can do some nasty things that normally would hurt so bad and you don't feel anything until the adrenaline crash. <laughs> um, that's also why a lot of times what they don't tell you in movies and books and things like that is after the mom has lifted the car off her kid and saved her kid, you know, later in the hospital, she's torn her muscles, her, her, um, her arms have popped out of their sockets and things like that because you still, your body can still only endure so much, but what happens is adrenaline turns the pain off so that you can do what you need to do in that moment. And that's really what happens with this trope is adrenaline is in full force right now. Um, so these parents are doing whatever it is they have to do. And I also love this because sometimes you really get to see the parents make some interesting decisions. Um, this one clip I have to put in here is absolutely my favorite. How ironic that your father's death was the key to our escape. I so wanted to thank him personally, but now you will have to do it for me. Oh, King Kai! <laughs> <laughs> my son needs my help! You can't go, Goku! You're dead! <laughs> So I love this clip. Um, I actually really like Goku as a father. He's one of my favorite father figures, and I think he gets a bad rap. But that's another video for another day. I love this clip because his kid is in trouble. His kid is essentially being killed. He's all Goku is dead. He is in the afterlife. So he's not supposed to go from the afterlife to the regular world. But his kid's in danger, and he really doesn't care. He doesn't care what the rules are. He's going to go and he's going to help because that's his kid. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I think I have a knack for characters who, especially characters that normally would obey rules. 
suddenly saying to hell with the rules. I'm going to go because I love this person. I care about this person. I don't know. I, I love those kind of scenes because it's a really good way to show your character's priorities. What's most important to them? What is going to be the top of their list? And in adventure and fantasy stories, I think you have a lot of opportunities to really dig into this because most of the time there's very much a, you know, we have to finish this quest because if we don't, the world's going to end or whatever. There's usually very high stakes. But despite that, when this trope comes up, the fate of the world is not on these characters' minds at all. They don't care. They don't care what happens to the world. They don't care about the quest at the moment. What's important is their child. It can turn the whole planet to gold as long as my precious laddies are safe. And I, that is such a strong indicator of the depth of their love for one another. And I just eat it up. <laughs> Every single time I see this, I just eat it up. So you will definitely find this trope in my works. It is probably sprinkled through my works a lot. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. I think I would love to see this more because like I said, in a lot of stories, a lot of times the parents aren't even there. They're, they're dead or they're absent. So whenever we have a parental connection that's strong and is good and is healthy, I am going to advertise the heck out of it because I need to see it more. <laughs> so that is basically my love of this trope is one of my favorite tropes. And I like it because, like I said, it doesn't have to be a biological parent. It can be a surrogate. So if it's someone that um, has taken on the role of a father or grandfather or whatever, they still count. And I really love that. So thank you guys for stopping in to um, check out this video with me. I hope I have not babbled on too much as I tend to do when I talk about things I like. But thank you guys for um, com coming by. As always, if you like this content, let me know. Leave a comment below and I will respond to it when I, when I can. I always love reading them. If you guys um, want to know whenever I upload, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos I put up. I upload every Thursday, every Sunday. And I'll try to throw some extras in there when I can. And until next time, I hope you guys have a good one.